Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Photography Show 2023 here at Center 415. My name is Lydia Malama Johnson. I'm the executive director of APAD, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the fair this year. I'm also honored and thrilled to be collaborating with the Muse Collection. This, um, this weekend has been an absolute joy, and the collaboration has lasted for the last couple of months, and it has <laughs> been... And uh, we're still talking. And we're still talking. I was just saying to Christina, and we still like each other, so it's really gone well. That's how you know it's been a successful one. Um, I'm not going to speak for very long. I just wanted to thank them, to thank Michael and Richard and your entire team. It's been fabulous to work with you, and I hope that you all enjoy this talk and the discussion of how this incredible collection was formed. I'm gonna hand it over to Christina now to say a few words about the collection, and please enjoy, and I hope you'll stay and look around the fair after the talk. Thank you, Lydia. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Christina Kokoris. I'm the Director of Communications for Muse Collection. I'd love to introduce you to my colleagues. This is Richard Grossbard, the advisor to Muse Collection, Lexi Horvath, the collection specialist, Lucrezia Di Martino, who is our Director of Partnerships, and not last but not least, Amanda Smith, who is our Director of Archives. So Muse Collection is a collection of photography archives located in Tenafly, New Jersey. Today at this lecture, you're going to learn all about who we are, what we do, and a little bit about our mission. And we would really love, after the lecture, if you would stay around and take a look at our exhibition that we've got here. With that, I'm going to pass it off to Richard Grossbard, who will make some introductions as well. Thank you, Christina. Uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming. It's w quite an attendance. Uh, it's a great crowd. I, um, I'm a little nervous, I'll be honest. So uh, anyway, I don't know if anybody was here yesterday and you had an opportunity to hear uh, Edgar Cowan speak and uh, Halima Taha. Uh, Edgar uh, was an, uh, is an amazing photographer. And he spoke yesterday about how do we look at photography. And, you know, Michael and I have always had this discussion about what is great art. And Egger sort of summed it up for me yesterday. He said to this crowd, he said, you know, when we look at photography, you think you're looking at it with your eyes, but you're looking at it with your heart. And when we look around here at this diverse amount of images, something will resonate with you, uh, and different people resonate with different things. Uh, Halima spoke about gratitude, and I just wanted to express my gratitude to a number of people here. Um, and first I want to answer one question that kept on coming up, Michael. Everybody wanted to know, what is MUSE? So MUSE stands for Michael W. Sonnefeld, so <laughs> everybody should know. It's and it's pronounced MUSE, not MUSE <laughs> or MUSE, Mu MUSE, okay. So anyway, since I joined the collection uh, in 2020, Michael has been my friend, my intellectual partner, and my mentor, and helping me to take the Muse Collection to where it is today. Uh, I would like to recognize Michael's passion, dedication, curiosity, and generosity to this undefined project. <laughs> For those who don't know Michael, this may sound strange to you, but he does not define himself as a collector. He defines himself as a creator and a transformer. So Michael is a business leader who created Tiger 2001, a uh, peer learning community that takes on topics that matter most to his members. They are fellow visionaries, entrepreneurs, investors, and executives from an array of industries. Michael is a philanthropist who has now put his whole focus on climate change, which I think is one of the most important issues that we face today. Uh, he has supported a new research center uh, in Israel. Uh, he has also uh, created some green industries, and we should be grateful for that. Now I'd like to thank my friend Charlie Traub, who at the last minute when I asked, would you moderate, just said, what time? <laughs> Which, you know, that's, a, that's a friend, just what time? So my friend of 40 years, who has generally given, uh, given us his time today to moderate our talk, for those people who do not know Charlie, which would be surprising to me, uh, to his credit, Firmos, he is a great photographer with numerous photo books to his credit. He has had more than uh, 60 exhibitions in galleries and museums throughout the world. Charlie has dedicated himself to photographic education and has been a chairperson at the School of Visual Arts for 30 years. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. <coughs> I would like now to uh, thank a few people who are not on this podium. Uh, 
Amanda, could you step forward, please? So Amanda Smith is the director of the Muse Archive. She is my cur co-curator who has helped me organize this exhibition, who has worked tirelessly for the last two months to make this look as good as it does. And she handles 500,000 photographs. I just want you to imagine what that means. And she does it with such dedication, and I cannot thank her enough for all the help that she has given to me to make this possible. Uh, the next person I'd like to mention is our team, which is Lexi, Christina introduced, um, David Constein, uh, Greg Peace, Bill Pennington, uh, Mary Helen Silagi, James Garfinkel here in the audience, who was instrumental in helping Michael start this collection. Uh, we met Christina Kokuros, and of course, Lucretia DiMartino. Also, who's not here at the moment, but I'm looking around, is Kathleen Dunleavy, who uh, is the VP of Muse, who is very instrumental in our help. So most importantly, I would like to thank Lydia Melamed Johnson, the executive of APAD, and I will tell you, this is amazing. Can you imagine, to 50 exhibitors are here, 50 happy exhibitors, <laughs> I will say. Everybody talks so highly of you, Lydia. And uh, she has just been unbelievable. I'm, I t I, Michael is gonna have a wedding in uh, December. I suggested that he hires her for this <laughs> wedding because this is unbelievable what she did. Thank you, Lydia, very much for everything you did for us. Also part of our team is Arnika Johnson, who is the chair of APAD Education Committee. And then I want to make a shout out to a very special gentleman here named Joel Morrison. Joel, could you, everybody in the corner there. He is the operations uh, director. When you see all this and run so smoothly, it is because of Joel. So Joel, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> lastly, and most important gratitude I would like to express is to my wife, uh, Ronnie, who is my lifelong partner, my biggest supporter, and my guiding star. So now before we uh, start the discussion, I would like to address the question as to what Muse is. First of all, we are not a private museum. We, not, we are not a nonprofit, and probably not a business model that you would want to emulate, <laughs> as we have not been able to monetize this collection in 10 years. Uh, we are a place of discovery. This is who we are. This is a place when you come to the Muse Collection in Tenafly, I hope many of you will have an opportunity to do, uh, do so. You will see what I consider one of the most beautiful, fantastic archives that is really just spectacular. Um, I hope we at Muse will have inspired you, you all to come and join us on our journey and to explore a collection of our great photographers, which we will discuss later. And please also visit all the other 50 exhibitor friends of ours here who have put up some wonderful photographs throughout these two floors. Uh, I hope you will enjoy these discussions about Muse and its role and its responsibility as a custodian of a great archive and our discussion on what we can do to preserve all the wonderful archives that are coming to market now from great photographers who are now in their 70s and 80s and are looking for a home. Anyway, thank you uh, everybody for coming and now I'm gonna hand over to Charlie. Well, thank you, Michael and Richard, uh, for inviting me here to do this. Uh, and thank all of you for being here. This is a wonderful audience. Um, and I know we all have something in common. There's a lot of familiar faces here, but certainly photography and its role in American and international culture and in our lives every day is what's on everybody's mind. Um, this is an interesting moment in the history of the lens and screen arts, as I call it. Uh, you all are aware of what's happening with AI. It's going to be everywhere and anywhere. Uh, it's going to have wonderful things for us, and it's going to have some potentially bad things for us. And we're just beginning to parse it. Um, I talk for years about something called a creative interlocutor, which these two are. That's the person who brings things together, of creativity, editors, curators, <coughs> programmers, photographers, 
artists coming together, using what they love and do to enable others to be creative. That's the real issue, I think, in the 21st century, how we can gain something from someone else's creativity. And this is such a project, uh, Muse. It is an effect of bringing material, to I'm sorry, I'm terrible at these microphones, bringing material together for the resource of other people's creativity. Now, as a photographer, I've been at this for 55 years, teaching and photographing, and as an artist, and I am one of those people now reaching 80, close to it, and we're all wondering what we're going to do with our archives. And, you know, we want to make some money from it. But basically, most image makers want to make sure it's preserved. Preserved because it's a life's labor, but also because embedded in those archives is a richness of history, fact, record, all kinds of things that a future generation will use in ways we cannot imagine. So the preservation of the analog world in particular the analog world of our medium is pretty essential at this point. The negative is about the base of truth that we might get to, or at least of record, given what AI may do in terms of morphing imagery into all kinds of iterations. So my question to Michael and to Richard is, you know, how, how does this collection get used? How can it expand to serve all these potential unknown issues? I'm not particularly interested in, okay, this is art and this isn't. Art is very much about where it's seen, the context it's in, and who says it's art. But another generation will deal with something else that will be seen in the face of that woman that we cannot imagine. So I'm so happy that there's somebody wanting to put together collections, indeed, without necessarily a specific intention to make profit on it, <coughs> but to open it up to all the things that the research we will need to have in order to verify things in the future. Thank you. So I think you have a presentation. Oh, you want to do the presentation first? No, no. go. No, talk. You oh, should talk. No, no, it's you, Michael. You, you're the man. I, I don't have a presentation. Uh, but I can talk a little bit about the collection specifically. How does this come to be? I think that was That's the question. Uh, your question. And the first question I always ask, somebody mentioned it, is this a nonprofit activity? And I say, so far. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the point is that we started uh, thinking about acquiring lots of photographs. I mean, lots by 100, 100 photographs, 50 photographs, sometimes 1,000 photographs. And there's lots of reasons there's a market for people who collect lots of photographs. And some of them are because investors form the intermediary between an artist and a museum. And those investors will hold on for, they'll invest for a year or two or three, and then they donate to the museum. And it really depends where you sit to understand even what I'm talking about. Because if you're in a museum, this is giving you access to art objects that are donated that you couldn't afford or you don't have the budget to buy. And so this is how the American museum system is largely work. Of course, museums have acquisition budgets. But on average, the gifts are greater. Uh, and all of the great museums do that. Um, but if you're just collecting photographs for a year and a day to then donate them to a museum, while that's worked in the past, the IRS wonders, is this really a business that you're going into of buying and donating? That's not a legitimate business purpose. And so long ago, even though we got into this literally 30 years ago thinking about that, what we realized was there are estates that are available. They're few and far between. This is 10 years of acquisitions, where for some reason, the photographer was important but underappreciated. And of course, 
in this crowd debating what's important and what's underappreciated, we could spend hours and hours just debating those parameters. But um, it's just a, a our own, and some of it reflects our own aesthetic about could we do something to bring an artist's work to a new audience or could we reveal something about an artist's work that had not been seen before? And a perfect example is Andre Didion at the, the first there is really known for um, finding be the per being the person who discovered Norma Jean. And at Norma Jean's age of 18, she came into his studio and they fell in love for six years. They had some kind of affair. Um, and although he was in the 50s a nude photographer, never took a nude picture of Marilyn Monroe to the best of our knowledge because he took 400 pictures that defined the um, transformation of Norma Jean into Marilyn Monroe. And the body of that work, we only have one or two Marilyns over there. It, when you see the body of this work, 400 pick, it just will take your breath away. You can't be in this world and not have her image seared into your mind. It's interesting, if you go to the um, national licensing show and say, who are the three most uh, recognized images in the world of commerce as personalities. Who do, who do you think they are? First? I can't hear. Muhammad Ali. Who said Muhammad Ali? Elvis. Yeah, so Muhammad Ali is one. Elvis, Elvis. Elvis is two. Marilyn. Marilyn is three. So we have this amazing honor to have two of the three recognized and of course um, whether they meet the same artistic quality is a matter of taste. But the reason I'm bringing it up is on the top left, you see two surreal pictures in the Andre Didion piece. Not one in a thousand photo people know that Andre Didion was experimenting with surrealism in the 50s, just as the great surrealists were coming into being. And now there's a resurgence of surrealism and we have a collection of about 100 of his photographs that you'll probably see in other venues as the next years unfold because he was sort of in this amazing vanguard but was never known for it. So that would be an example of what we do. I think I'll, I'll end simply by saying what we've been striving to figure out is what is the team? What are the skills? What is the approach to take five very different uh, estates and uh, perhaps more after that. And so we have archivists, we have restorers or have to be in touch with restorers. We have researchers, we're digitizing everything. That means we're cataloging everything. And just the storage and maintenance to make sure we can preserve these amazing pieces of history uh, is, is no small feat. And we also have a facility that we make open to researchers and museums that are now increasingly coming uh, to us. So I think this is sort of a, a pleasure for me. I'm gonna end simply by saying this is our 10th anniversary. And as Charlie said, we really are still refining what we're doing. We're fortunately in a position that we're able to underwrite all of this. We expect that we're creating value in these collections, uh, but it's a 10 year process from the beginning to what we hope are successful uh, high points within those collections. And there are not many people who are willing to underwrite a 10 year process. I think that's part of what we're about and that's why we're here. Can I ask you a question? Uh, given your history of activism and uh, involved in ecological and on all kinds of wonderful things to get people on the mark. <laughs> um, why, n and, and I look at the Fred McDara stuff and when I first came to New York or even well before reading the Village Voice, I mean Fred McDara was a major documentarian of a moment in a history, a community, uh, an ethos. Why not uh, say, create a collection about 
ecological issues or about certain of your political issues or peace in the Middle East uh, and start expanding in that way, not to say that we sh you shouldn't deal with a well-known artist or a well-known Hungarian uh, and other things, but do are you thinking in those terms? So this in originated uh, like in a different part of my brain from my work on climate. And uh, there are some amazing photographers who are documenting the changes to our planet. Um, if one of those estates became available and what we do to preserve those estates and what we do to invest in having those estates known to a broader audience were available to us, we would definitely look at it. But I think this is preserving a part of history that's at risk. It's at risk because um, great photographers, only a portion of them because of the economic circumstances of their work are foundations created that become sort of self-perpetuating foundations. The great bulk of many artists' work is that the economics don't allow for that and either they or their heirs have to decide how to keep it alive. And the only thing, I, what I'd say is, we're probably not the most, um, the highest bidder all the time because when we take on a project, the amount we invest in preserving the collection and promoting it can often be m multiples of what we paid for the collection. And many living artists, because they've been doing that work themselves, don't fully appreciate what the cost is to have a full-time archive with eight full-time people and facilities uh, and so forth. But the answer is um, we think that there are great, so I'm, I'm proud of the social component of many of our artists, particularly as an example, uh, some of you may have seen uh, Fred McDara was the most important documentarian on all of the political activities going on in the village in the 60s from anti-war movement to the first gay rights. Um, one of the greatest things, some of you may have seen it, uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, uh, the um, Saks Fifth Avenue did on Fifth Avenue, just up the block, a full panorama of seven of their major windows. And uh, this is, uh, I guess this is a picture of that. Um, you're seeing one of the seven windows, but each window had a different rainbow neon sign. It was one of the most beautiful displays. They were all our pictures and I, I couldn't have been prouder. When we bought the Fred McDarrah collection, we weren't thinking that five years later it would be the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall uh, riots and James actually was the uh, genius behind buying that. Uh, but as each year has gone by, and some of you, if you're not watching our Instagram feed, every day we print a picture where we have a picture from that day in history and we get thousands or hundreds of comments that our daily Instagram feed is bringing people back through our photographs in history. But my point is, that's another example of Fred McDara's sort of, for lack of a better way of saying it, the gift that keeps on giving. Events keep coming up that are hearkening back to what he documented 50 years ago. So it's just, it's just an amazing treat. The energy of it I is, is remarkable and, and your investment in it emotionally and I'm sure economically is, is remarkable. I'm just wondering what you're looking for as you move forward. Would you still buy whole archives or maybe focus on a particular er particular era or a particular style in which you know you, you, you have uh, two people who are involved with personality and historical figures? Um, what, where are you going next? Where the wind blows. I think what would be hard to fully convey if I had longer is the evolution of our thinking over the years. Today what we would buy is completely different than what we were looking at six years ago, largely because of the focus that Richard has brought. I'm I like to use the word transformer, but Richard is one of the world's great photographic collectors and his knowledge of photography 
um, I was very nice when he said I was one of his mentors, but he's one of mine. I don't know if that's possible. Can mentors mentor each other? I guess so, because uh, that's, that's what's been happening. Um, so, uh, you know, the documentary, it, it's interesting, when, when we finally acquired Turboville and Solomon, they have a following that's totally different than the other three artists. Deborah Turboville has a global following that each time we show her work, people from five and ten countries are flying in just to be part of what this woman represented in the 70s and 80s. It's, it's like the most remarkable story. And uh, if any of you are playing with this new chat bot, uh, GBT, uh, we asked chat GBT, who are the photographers who were influenced by Deborah Turboville. We've been trying to figure that out for a year or two. In 30 seconds, we got a list of seven photographers and how they had credited Deborah Turboville with uh, being her inspiration. Uh, and Rosalind Fox Solomon is the only living artist of our five. And she and just. And excuse me. Yes. Today is her 94th birthday. Wow. Just to let you know. And uh, her collection of life in the time of AIDS has just been um, acquired by the National Gallery as a premier documentary. She's not a documentarian per se, but she documented the AIDS era in the most compelling, almost overwhelmingly beautiful, sad collection of work that now is we're proud to have housed at the uh, National Gallery. Um, so Deborah Turberville and Rosalind Fox Solomon we thought were sort of more of where we were going. But all of a sudden, um, Fred McDara, because his work, although you think of him as a documentarian, he was obviously a world-class photographer, by the way. He was the photography editor of the Village Voice, and in something almost unheard of, he retained the rights to all of his work that was published in the Village Voice. Most times, a photographer won't have that. So we have all of his work, it's about 75,000 objects, all of his work that was published in the Village Voice, we have uh, the rights to. And also, Michael, we also have there the negatives and yeah. the contact sheets, which and his diaries, which is a great source of information for us. Yeah. So we'll be and showing- And for the period. Fred, excuse me? And for the period, the oh. time. Yeah, we'll be showing Fred's work, uh, particularly his work on the gay riots, um, and uh, it's not just the riots. He did a series of three young gay men who in the 60s, the law suggested that if you were gay, you were a public nuisance. And these three young men dressed up in banker suits and went to a bar and asked to be served and loudly said, but we're gay. It was all, he, Fred was there photographing and they couldn't not serve them. They were the exact opposite of a nuisance and those three men are kind of like the Rosa Parks of uh, how gay rights evolved in, uh, in New York. And that's all documented. I think that was recently published in um, one of the magazines, uh, Pan, um, Pan, Pan and the Dream. If you don't know it, they published that whole series. It was quite, quite fantastic. So all of a sudden, you take Fred McDara, who's a documentarian, but you look at the social context of his work, and uh, we're going to be featuring Fred's work at uh, Parry Photo this November. Um, so what are we looking for? Every one of these artists documented a moment in time. Of course, you could say that about almost any photographer, but these struck us as particular moments, the, the, the time in which Elvis and Marilyn were becoming successful, the moments in time uh, that happened in the village. The picture of Deborah Turboville uh, in the middle, right by uh, the photographer who's standing right next to it. Um, that picture, can, can I, yeah, that picture uh, was the centerpiece of perhaps the most important article in uh, Vogue, Vogue, in Vogue in the 70s. It's called the Bathhouse Series. And Deborah Turboville, in that moment, changed fashion photography. Until that moment, Bathing suits were worn by five foot six svelte blonde women who came off the tennis court without an ounce of sweat. That was the standard of what 
female fashion ba bathing suit photography, and she turned it completely up an end. She not only will you see it from there, but the she spoke to women in a complete new way. And today, if you look at fashion magazines today in any of the catalogs, you can literally document the impact Deborah Turbeville had 50 years ago that's st still going strong. So um, I think the answer is we're looking for collections that document in some particular way a transformation in our society, a moment where things changed and does it with elegance and great quality. And then, of course, for all of the great photographers who do that, only a small portion would put their estates up for sale and a smaller portion we would know about and find out about. So the funnel gets pretty narrow pretty quickly. So these, these, are, no, these are each needles in a haystack that took, every one of these took almost a year of negotiation. It's a very long process. Uh, but we're quite proud with what we've accomplished. I think Richard wants to say <coughs> something. So, um, as Michael was telling you, you know, it, it's a tremendous effort to uh, organize and to bring this material to the public. Um, in the last, since I arrived, uh, I've helped Michael put these uh, very important works, uh, starting with Deborah Turberville in Paris Photo. Uh, we sponsored PAN, uh, which is a art magazine um, solely with the sole sponsors as they could not find a sponsor, and they featured a Deborah Turbo article in there. And that magazine, we've also uh, did a feature of uh, Fred McDara, and uh, we also did a second one with Deborah Turbo. And all three of those magazines, just to give you an idea of our trying to get our word out there of what we accomplished and what we're trying to do, ended up in every major university library, every major uni uh, museum around the world. And so it was just another way of us getting recognition for these artists. In the meantime, just to uh, expand on Michael's talking about Fred McDara, um, that we are gonna have a major monograph being published in, uh, by Thames and Hudson in November on Deborah Turberville's collages. Um, also, uh, the largest museum in uh, Europe is co known as Photo Lycée, and Photo Lycée is going to do a, I'll say, monster exhibition on Deborah Turville and her collages, um, and it's and that is going to be uh, quite a thing. And what we're going to be doing at Paris Photo, if you have the opportunity to come, um, we're going to do something quite extraordinary that hasn't been done before as we are going to try to explain photography, and not just through the eyes of the prints, but where they stand in publications and so forth. There's also, we had made a, an attempt to do a documentary in Deborah Turbeville. Unfortunately, the, the uh, sizzle reel is not uh, working in conjunction with this uh, monitor, but we are now revisiting that, and um, that will be another project that is on our table. So um, again, it, to bring all these artists out and to bring them to the public is no small feat. You have to have a team like our great team here that's standing by the door to, uh, to do all this work. Um, that's all I want to say about that. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'd just like to emphasize that many of you are collectors, many of you are photographers, all of us are photographers these days, but Managing an archive, whether you're just a single person managing your own or a museum managing it, is tremendous labor. Um, just detail and organization and care and storage and all kinds and resources and retrieval, all these things. And it's been my experience that the museums cannot handle it anymore that they, they don't have the manpower, woman power to, to, to do it. And that this kind of entity is happening um, might be inspiration for others to start saying, this has to be preserved, this history of what I will call the, the, a, the end of the analog and uh, as we enter into a whole new era of image making. And a lot of you are collectors, and uh, we all collect something. Every photographer is a collector. That's why we take pictures. But there has to be an idea behind a collection to make it meaningful. 
And I remember thinking as a child, as a stamp collector, you know, I got this one, I put it on that page and filled in the little thing in the stamp album, you know. But then somebody said, well, why don't you specialize in something? So I specialized in map stamps. And actually, I have a pretty nice still collection from my childhood of maps. It taught me st stuff about geography all over the world. And I, I would urge all of you to start thinking about, rather than just getting the best jewel of this and the best jewel of that, of which have been collected pretty much everywhere, start thinking about etching out a place, a time, a value that he said very clearly, Michael, that each of these represents a document of something important and a transition, not only of the medium, but of our history of how we look. And that, that seems to me to be the underlying idea here. That's very powerful. And think about what, mo what do I want to do other than just have one of these and one of those? I just want to add uh, two examples. The acquisition of the Andre Didion, Marilyn Monroe estate, and uh, Fred Wertheimer were two unrelated activities. They both came up in a different time period. We didn't acquire one with regard to the other. We had acquired Marilyn at first, and we knew of the popularity of these images, so we were aware of it. But we had some curators at the archive, and they said, these two speak to each other. They were doing the same things with photography. They were using photographers to promote their images in new creative ways. They only met apparently once in their lives. But the body of work that these two uh, artists represent gives us opportunities to show roughly 100 photographs that speak between ways in which Elvis was uh, promoting his image and she was promoting hers. And so don't be surprised if you see an announcement about an Elvis Marilyn show. There was one show about 30 years ago in New York, but it was multiple artists as opposed to one artist's vision side by side against another. Another example of what Charlie's talking about is in the Fred McDara um, photographs, after we acquired Fred's um, uh, collection, one of his closest friends uh, and a colleague um, came to us and said, I heard you bought Fred's, Mc Fred's collection. Would you consider buying mine? And all of a sudden now, we had two photographers where they had photographed even some of the same events at the same time through two completely different aesthetics and lenses. And those are some of the serendipities that come up. When you store the whole estate and you have it available for this kind of creative uncovering and sort of peeling of the onions, sometimes you get these serendipities that you just couldn't imagine uh, before that. So we probably should open it up to some questions. How about some questions? I know you all have lots in this. Yes, sir. Can you? Here, let me give you this. Nope, that's not going to work. I'll try and talk about it. I'll repeat it. I was just wondering whether you're considering collecting digital collections as opposed to analog. The question is, do we collect digital collections? Well, we've pretty much digitized everything that we have. I can't, uh, obviously digitizing a half a million images is a, it's like painting a bridge. By the time you get to one end, you're kind of starting again, hopefully digitize it once. We have not acquired an estate that was purely digital because frankly, it's the tactile, uh, the, the heart experience that comes from looking at these images. I mean, this image kind of will take your breath away. And I know, you know, so at this point, uh, I would never say never. We're obviously aware of NFTs. We're looking at uh, what role NFTs could be. But basically, our dedication is focused on mostly black and white, not exclusive, but it's collections that uh, display these kind of transition moments. And if there was such a collection that was purely in a digital medium, we'd have to think about how would we use the skills that our team has to promote it? Because it's been hard enough to figure this out. I'm not sure we know exactly how to do the digital medium. But never say never. Another question, please. Wow, 
Yes. Yes. The, uh, the biggest success that we've had is that a close friend of one of these artists came to us and said, I see what you're doing with this artist. Would you consider acquiring our estate so that you would, so I could know that when I'm gone, that's how you'll treat it. I'd say that's literally the biggest honor because it, this, this is a very unusual creature. It's, we're not a museum, we're not a gallery. We, there's millions of dollars invested to create this. And yet in the end, we're being entrusted with artists' life work. And that's the most important thing that we're doing and instilling in our entire team a, a little bit of humility. The objective is to preserve and promote the work so that new audiences can see it and I can't think of a better success metric than the fact that artists are now coming to us, which we never expected. That's sort of the 10 year anniversary gift. Um, yeah. Someone else, please. We don't even think of ourselves as a company, but I understand the. Organization the and, uh, or foundation. Yeah. Um, what would I have to give up to give you everything that I have to, or to uh, allow you to have everything? No, my, Michael, Please. Michael, can I answer that one? Please. Okay. So, uh, for, first of all, we're not looking for people to give up anything. And uh, that's first of all, because we respect all the photographers that have come to us. In the last. Uh, 10 days alone since we saw people saw the announcement, we've had maybe 50 photographers come to us to uh, acquire their archives. Um, to understand what it takes to make a decision on an archive uh, is quite lengthy. Um, and again, as Michael was speaking to it, that we are evolving and trying to decide what is the right move on a particular archive. So I, I know that there are a number of photographers who came to me here already during the show that are here in the audience. And um, I want them to understand that what Michael and myself are trying to do is trying to figure out that question. As a matter of fact, what part of one part of this talk with Charlie uh, we had discussed is it is just not Muse's responsibility to uh, take in archives. It's that we're looking to make this a responsibility of a larger community. Museums are taxed right now because of budgets. Um, there are very few people that have the largesse of Michael. Um, so I was m myself curious when we were kind of talking with Charlie before this talk, what is it that we are trying to do collectively here to look at archives? Uh, as um, the next months go by, and we are gonna look at a number of archives, we have to make a decision, and it's very painful decisions to say, why, is this, why choose this one over another one? So th we're not asking anybody to give up anything. We're uh, trying to partner with anybody, um, the living artists, because the, the dead artists are much easier to work with, frankly. Um, <laughs> but with all joking aside, um, we, are, we are evolving. And this is, a, this is a very special place that it continues to evolve. And we have a team that's dedicated to uh, looking at all work that is possible that comes to our view. And at the same time, we have to take care of the 500,000 photographs that we have in the place at the moment and to promote them so that they get seen. So again, uh, to the photographers that are here, we love all the work that we've seen. Now all the work has been fantastic. But uh, again, it's going to take us time to make the next decision, and we don't expect to give anybody uh, to give up anything. Is yeah, that right? When to be specific to your question, if you are still a working photographer, that's why this might take a year to negotiate, 
because the last thing we want to do is inhibit your ability to be a working photographer. So as an example, if we, part of what we're doing is providing capital to photographers in their later years so that the pressures they're under are lessened. But we're acquiring rights that become spring into action upon a photographer's death. So you might have all the flexibility you want with your collection. In some cases, we'll take exhibition prints for our archive and leave the work prints. Uh, in some cases, depending on if you're continuing to sell, we'll either have some kind of formula or we'll ascribe it. it it's the, the reason this is so difficult is none of these f five transactions are a cookie cutter. If you think of a gallery, you go to a gallery, they get a certain percentage, you could go to this, I'm not minimizing the work of a gallery, but the basic relationship between an artist and a gallery is well known. In this case, because living artists each have completely different standards, and frankly, that's why this is so difficult, Art living photographers, it's very different between um, painting and photographer. A painter paints one painting or paints a hundred paintings. A photographer has a hundred thousand photographs or fifty thousand photographs. And not all of those photographs are worth what the most expensive photograph sold for. In fact, for many photographers, the value of their collection might be in one or two percent of their photographs, their iconic photographs. But we want to preserve the entirety of the estate. And so one of the decisions we've made is there are other people who might just take that small portion of the iconic photographs and leave everything, unless it's important to the photographer to have the estate remain intact and to have it seen by future generations. They have other options, but it won't be about legacy. It'll be about monetizing or something else. We're trying to find that balance, and each time is a completely new thing. All I can say is we approach it in a partnership format. In other words, at, at another scale, we don't do this now, if a photographer came to us and said, would you represent me while I'm alive and then own the collection after I'm gone, that's a kind of concept we'd entertain. We're not, we're not equipped to do it now, but my point is fundamentally, if we can have photographers trust our dedication to our craft, and know that their work will be appreciated in ways I they can't even have it appreciated on their own because we're publishing magazines, we're publishing books, we're doing documentaries, we're sponsoring things. This is a good example. We, we're not selling anything here, we're just an exhibit. I don't know how many, I don't know how, know how many exhibitors there are. Most of, the, most of the people here are galleries who are doing their work. But we're, we're trying to lift up an artist's work for whatever reason, and that goes back to why I said we want to make sure the work is important. It has to be, we can't turn a mediocre photographer into a great photographer, but if a great photographer's work has not been fully appreciated, that's, that's the craft that we're trying to uh, work with. Uh, Mary Engel in the back, just let me say that the body of work is what counts, not the icon. <laughs> it's the body of work of a given <coughs> image maker and, and or a statement within a body of work of multiple imagery that makes the importance and, and also the history. One image is tells us one thing, a thousand images tells us something much more. Mary Engel from, a, uh, <laughs> I want to say A-Bag, a bag, uh, archival organization.
Thank you. Thank you very much. One more question, I guess. Yeah. Are you okay with that? Yes, indeed. If there is one. Yes. Here, thank here. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is a real treat, and thank you for celebrating our 10th anniversary with us. Nice job. Very good job.